on. Um, Asma has actually appointed me moderator, so hopefully we can get through all of our topics seamlessly and relatively on time. But that being said, I thought it would be um, a little bit useful just to, uh, for us to share a little bit about our backgrounds, just put ourselves in context. Asma. I think I, my entire childhood and upbringing was, my destiny was to be on the fringes. I grew up in a patriarchal society and I feel that hospitality, which is my industry, is like a Mayfair all-male club where women can be occasional guests, but you never really belong, and I do not belong. I am on the fringe of hospitality, but I was also on the fringe of the society where I grew up. I was born um, from both sides, father and mother's side, from a royal family, and of course I wasn't the blessed boy, which is always a problem. But I presumed that just like all the other girls in my family, I'd get married at 18 to a prince from one of the clans. But of course, I was the dark, fat, ugly one. And very early on, I realized that unlike all the other girls in my family who looked like princesses, who behaved like that, I was the disruptor, the outsider, the renegade. And you know, obviously no, no mother-in-law wanted someone like me. So I was the first girl in my family to go to college because I wasn't married. What would I do? But then I realized very quickly that there is an advantage and strength from being the outsider. And a lesson that, you know, that I learned as a young woman in India uh, was that in our society, in every meal, women ate last, girls ate least. This was how it was. This is deep-rooted in all agrarian societies. You know, Ireland, Colombia, Mexico, you go to all these societies where the men are fed. Of course, because they're the hunter-gatherers, they've been killing dinosaurs or whatever. <laughs> you, you need to serve them. And this whole idea was complicated by the fact that our food is so patriarchal. And I had all these things that I realized that food is deeply political. It is really about, you know, justice and rights and who you are. And because I couldn't marry anyone from the clans, I was very lucky. I had an arranged marriage, which, please, let me, can I add, is different from a forced marriage, OK? You agree to do that. <laughs> so it's an arranged marriage from a professor who was teaching at Cambridge. I wanted to marry an intelligent person, someone who was liberal. He told me, oh, fine, you know, you don't have to I don't believe in gender roles. I'm going to cook for you. Didn't tell me you're such a bad cook. And I came to Cambridge thinking, oh, no, I'm going to have Dawat, which is the Indian feast. You know, someone's going to look after me. It didn't work out that way. It was pretty tough. It was pretty hard. I learned to cook. And then I did what is what you would expect from all good Indian you know, girls. You either be a lawyer or a doctor. Everyone tells you that. So I decided to study law. I did law. and. I did a PhD in law, so when I want to sound very poncy and very posh, I can say I'm a doctor, but I, I'm not a chef, I'm a cook. And I then uh, realized you know, that I got no pleasure from law. What gave me pleasure was feeding and cooking people. That, is became, that became my career. I chose to cook for people from my house uh, as a supper club initially. 10 years ago, someone who looked like me, accented, Muslim, immigrant, you didn't see on food media food television at all. There was Mother Jaffrey, and then there was no one. So I didn't think I belonged in the industry. I started from my home, and then, of course, I moved on to doing um, you know, something, supper clubs outside. Eventually, I ended up with a restaurant. 2017, I've been five years a restauranter, five years doing other kind of food. And that, essentially, is my story. I'm a, the only Indian female founder of an all Indian women's kitchen in the world, and that's Darjeeling Express. <laughs> Asma and I are old friends, and we've, we've cooked together, we've fused our cuisines together, we've done Corindian dinner, so it's, it's very um, happy for us to be on stage together. So I think a lot of what we're talking about today is just paving your own way. And um, I'm going to just start talking about my, my father, because I feel there is a lot to what we're doing in terms of paving our own way, but it's also about creating your own luck. And my father, um, we talked about Korea, I'm Korean of descent, and my father was born in 1939, when Korea was one country, and he was born in a small town in what is now North Korea. Um, and uh, it was, it's a crazy story, but very typical for most people of, of his generation. Um, 
just before the war in 1950, he fled the north with his entire family, eight brothers and sisters, by foot, and they made it to a small island on the southern tip of the peninsula called Jeju. And there he grew up in a refugee camp under very, very poor circumstances and situations, and four of his older brothers were drafted into the war. Miraculously, everyone survived, and through hard work and sheer will and determination, my father ended up making it to medical school, because you just became doctors back then. There were no other things to do. Um, and, um, and, uh, and ended up um, immigrating to the United States in the 1960s, along with most of his medical school classes. This is when they relaxed the immigration laws to America, a great brain drain of Korea, for degrees that they needed. Um, my mother also was, um, was kind of crazy. Everybody was trying to get out of Korea at this time, because as you learned before, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. It's kind of also miraculous that now they've built up to be the 10th largest economy in one generation. So my mom um, is even more crazy because uh, most families were not even thinking about educating their daughters back then. And to travel as a female alone and to go abroad was basically unheard of. She's like, I'm getting out of this hellhole called Korea, and I am going to pursue a master's degree in chemistry, and I'm going to get a scholarship at Ohio State University in the middle of nowhere. And so my parents, um, they met in the States, and they really didn't speak English very well, because back then you learned English fr from books, weren't any English speakers. They met, and I was born in the great state of New Jersey, hence my amazing accent. <laughs> And, um, you know, I just kind of went into the sciences, went to engineering school, and then went into finance. And I pursued a career in fixed income derivatives uh, for about five or six years. And then I had an epiphany. And I decided, you know, I can't chase a paycheck anymore. I am not inherently happy. I really want to chase my passion. And all I ever wanted to do in my free time was just read cookbooks and read about chefs. And I just wanted to cook and eat. And so I was like, there's got to be a career in this. So I just quit, much to the chagrin of my parents. They were very upset. I have to say. And I said, I don't care. I'm an American girl. I grew up in America and I am going to pursue uh, my luck in the cooking industry. And so I um, went to FCI in New York, the French Culinary Institute, and the rest is history. You know, cookbooks, television shows, restaurants later. Um, I'm on my sixth restaurant now, opening up in Las Vegas in December. But what, <laughs> thank you. But what, um, and, and I'm still waving this, this you know, Korean flag and this Korean bladder and trying to spread the love of Korean food around the world. And it's, this leads to our next topic of how food has become an important vehicle for cross-cultural sharing. And in my lifetime, I think this is particularly pertinent for Korean food because when I grew up, I was embarrassed about my lunchbox. Like, nobody knew where Korea was. <laughs> that people thought it was part of Thailand. Even when I opened up my first restaurant here in London about eight years ago, you know, the top food critics came in and said, compared me to Thai restaurants by name and said, my food is missing lemongrass and lime. I'm like, are you kidding? You know? And so I was like, look at a map. And so, and now it's, it's crazy because I'm being bombarded with so many questions from around the world, you know, about what are they eating in Parasite? What are they eating? What are they drinking? Squid Games, I'm watching this, and you know, Korean dramas are a big fuel of this because they're translated into 90 different languages around the globe. It, it's, it's real, it's happening, and it's kind of created this almost great but also weird cultural voyeurism, I have to say, around Korean culture. But um, it's been very, very, very exciting. And, um, but I've also had to do a lot of education. You know, people don't really recognize the cultural differences within East Asia. And I think that that's very difficult. You know, they think it's Thailand. They don't understand that in, in Korea, or in Asia, rather. Um, we are separated. We are a very fragmented, you know, fragmented continent. We don't share an alphabet. We don't share a language. We don't share a religion. And so Korea is its own country, and it's, it has its own unique cuisine. So a lot of this has been about an education. And I believe asthma has had the exact opposite experience, right? Yes. Uh, so where, you know, Judy was talking about the early days of people not knowing what Korean food was. When I moved to this country as a new bride uh, in 1991, I got a shock when I went to the first Indian restaurant. I was like, whoa, what is this? Because I had like no clue the rice came multicolored. And, <laughs> and all the names were like so random. I didn't even know. It was like, you know, my God, what's this next dish going to look like? And I realized that this is a problem that everybody thought, it's like saying I'm going to go and have American food. They thought Indian food is, an, is, is something. You know, in India, three villages you go, you temper the dal differently. We are very different. We're, we're separated by the basic thing. Rice growing, wheat growing, rice growing, wheat growing. If you are eating roti, your entire food is going to be different. If you're eating rice and we eat with our hands, 
The gravy is very important, you know. It, it is the texture, you know, and it's what you, what you grow locally. You know, we didn't have fridges, you know. It, food didn't move from areas, you know. So we use coconut oil, mustard oil. Even the oil we used was different. And despite, and the biggest problem, I got a shock here, everybody was telling me, when they saw that I made dal that was yellow, they said, what is dal? Dal is dal makhani. Absolutely bloody minuscule number of people eat dal makhani in India. But it's what all the five-star restaurants made, and that's what everyone thinks we eat. And it was a shock, because when I wanted to cook my food, and I wanted to do supper clubs in my house, I was so scared that nobody would come. I did all my first few supper clubs for charities, for hunger charities. Because I thought, you know, if they think my food is weird, at least they've donated to charity. I didn't even keep my costs. I completely lacked the confidence because it was against the tide of, you know, bright orange food, which, you know, was like, whoa, it just was so hard. And this is the difficulty that, you know, you are, I, food and culture has been separated very, very easily. Uh, and a bigger problem is that as a Muslim immigrant, an Indian, a female, now I'm 53, I want to tell people, you cannot take my food and, my, and separate culture from it. I won't let you eat it. You need to be someone who I can interact with. You break bread with me. You have a conversation with me about my food. And this was really important. And even though I've criticized the you know, curry houses that bought things, they changed the palate of a nation. And I'm very grateful for them. Even though it was food that was green or orange, I, I feel I stand on the shoulders of giants who were these people who allowed someone like me to become who I am today. Absolutely. And um, I think that, yeah. It's, it's important to also know that like food is so often the entry point to learning about a new culture. And it is something that we all have to engage in, we all have to eat. And it is the number one bonding experience that you can do with somebody that engages all the senses other than sex. You know? So this is why food is so highly emotive and emotional. And we have so many memories anchored around food. And this is why it's so important because the more you learn about other cultures, you learn about tolerance, you learn about mindfulness, and, and, and you learn to just respect each other more. And Asma spoke to about standing on shoulders, and I feel that we are always standing on each other's shoulders to try to break down these ceilings above us as minority women in this crazy male-dominated um, industry. You know, I often feel that kitchens are testosterone arenas. And what do you feel about that? Yes, and it, it is very difficult. I have a feeling that because, I just gave you one example, from Afghanistan to Sri Lanka, every home, the woman is cooking or the matriarch is in charge. When you look at middle range, high end restaurants in the east or the west, and I'm from both, you can make out from my accent, they're all men. Yes. And this, they have taken away our status completely. The stage is full of men. There is no place for someone like me. So as I pointed out earlier, I'm the only all female kitchen cooking Indian food in the world. And this is not an accolade. It's a point of shame for me. And the difficulty is, I realized, when I was trying to get a lease, you know, after Chef's Table, the place went mad. You know, we had bookings for, two, for you know, two years, we couldn't, we were struggling. I was trying to find a lease and everyone kept telling me, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, we, we gave it to someone. Who did they give it to? A mediocre white guy. And I was thinking like, oh, how interesting. And it was, all this was going on. I had to work for a bloody pandemic. When these mediocre white men failed, I got a lease of a big restaurant. This is unacceptable. I had to wait for men to fail to be able to get my restaurant. And every time before that, they always ask me, who's your business partner? They're looking for the suit. Yeah. And this is the problem, that if you're a female founder, and it doesn't matter, it's beyond color of skin, although I think that's a big issue as well. I realized one thing, that the way that in India you would ask, who, what's your father's name? Who's your husband? Are you married? Do you have children? They're kind of the offensive questioning of who you are which we all know has happened recently as well. People ask you, where are you really from? Uh, this idea that you know, you, you, they want to know where you're from and what you're doing. They want to put you in a box. My difficulty was that there was no man around me. The East and the West is equally biased when it comes to women. Everyone, it's just a veneer of respectability in the West. The bias is real against women. It's true, definitely. I mean, I think that we feel that we're always walking uphill or always sailing into the wind. It is a constant battle, but it's almost our normal 
You know what I mean? It is like we're just used to it all the time. And I, I get this question all the time, which, which really bothers me. You know, I tell people what I do, who I am, and they said, but you don't look like a chef. And I'm like, what is a chef supposed to look like? You know, and I feel it's because I haven't, you know, masculated myself entirely. Like if I cut off all my hair, maybe if I didn't wear makeup, you know, maybe if I was covered in tattoos or wore pierces or something, you know, I'd be taken more seriously in this industry that is just completely male dominated. And another thing that I find that, you know, I have to overcome too is that being an East Asian female, you know, breaking down that stereotype, you know, that I'm submissive, I'm obedient, you know, <laughs> that I am just, you know, just, just going to be quiet. And there's so many meetings where I've, you know, brought in a, a male counterpart and questions are directed towards him. They are asking questions and they expect him to answer. I'm like, I pay him. You know, like, I don't, I don't understand this. And then he's confused because they're asking questions to him. He's like, you know, and so it, it, it's, it's a dynamic that most people aren't used to and it causes a bit of su surprise in the room. But we are the unicorns right now, but we hope not to be the unicorns going forward. And we have these machetes and we are cutting down all of the obstacles for the next generation to come through. And, um, and we hope that they do come through. But the other thing that I think that does make us unique is the fact that we are career changers. And I think this is something that's particularly pertinent, especially after COVID. Everybody's kind of reevaluating their lives, gaining new perspective. And so Asma has done their career change, if you want to talk more about that. Yes, uh, for me, the career change was, of course, from law to food. But it is uh, even harder to change tracks when you're in your 40s. So I've been doing food for the last 10 years. I started when I was 43. And so you're not just dealing with the fact that you want to change careers. I had to deal with the bias about my age. And, you know, I am not in this battle of reproduction and use. The problem is that I had learned as a lawyer that you have to be on the right side of history. You speak up. And this is how. The law changed because there was a force from within to change it. Slavery, colonialism, you know, segregation. I'm not going to get off my seat from the bus. You needed one person to say that. Occupation. All of this will end one day when you are brave enough to say, I want to be on the right side of history. And for me, I re this is the skills I learned as a lawyer, which I've used in food. For me, people who've come to my supper club, come to my Biryani supper club, you get a speech from me on politics, on power, on justice, and equality. You get to eat my biryani. I will not let you leave the room because you're captive. You've paid for the meal. You're going to sit there while you eat. And I'm going to talk to you about power and injustice, about slavery and racism, and how food is about, you know, somehow people don't want to pay a lot of food on Indian food because we're seen as cheap and cheerful. They pay a lot for European food. This is racism. So the thing is that, you know, I'm a, you know I change careers, but I also realize one thing that, uh, I just want to say the last bit, which is that this is not the autumn of my life. This is the spring of my life. Look at me. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and for every game, there are two innings. I've come for my final innings. This is when I know I'm not going to get a chance to bat again. I'm going to hit every ball out of the park. <laughs> and that is, that is the difference when you come into a second career. You come with a passion and you come with a confidence, which is very different. I, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Yeah. So um, I come from a finance background and also an engineering background. And there's a famous saying that if you can run a restaurant, you can run a country. And let me tell you, it is true. Because you are wearing so many different hats. I never thought I would use my engineering skills with operations research and you know planning, queuing systems, ticket times, everything. I am running a business at the end of the day. It has to be profitable. I'm using my finance side and plus all the creativity. So it is, it is something that I think that has actually helped me to excel and I'm sure helped you to excel in the industry. Well, actually, frankly, most people don't even have a, a, a college degree or higher education. So I think that you know the fact that we can write, the fact that we can speak, we can read an auto cue, really, really has kind of propelled us to the front of, of, of our industry relatively quickly. And, um, and the whole thing about being a career changer, I say that um, I, I changed careers. I changed careers in my, in my, in my late 20s, early 30s, though. But um, I think it is, is a great time, though, because it's never too late to reinvent yourself. And I think it's perfect when you're older because you have the confidence to do 
so. You know, you can bet on yourself, and I think that's important in life. And I mentioned this before, but you have to create your own luck. Um, Confucius, famous Chinese philosopher, he said, famous quote, and the quote that I love, is that everybody has two lives. And the second one begins when you realize you have only one. Right, and so that's exactly what happened to me. I was like, I can't do this fixed income derivatives anymore. You know, like I want to go into something that I actually love. And you just have to have the confidence and the gumption to bet on yourself and just do it because you can. And I'm going to leave Asma to say a few last closing words, and that's it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, for for me, what is very important and which drives me all the time, is that, and you know, I think it's true for Judy and me, and for a lot of you all in the room as well. We are leaving a legacy. This is not about, you know, and I tell people this, and I go into a lot of schools in deprived areas and tell girls, you're not your dress size. You're not your father's name. You're not the number of followers you have on social media. You're whose life you changed. And this is the opportunity that you can go and change your life. And for me, and I know for Judy as well, people, long after I'm dead, so a woman is going to get on a stage like this. She's going to go into a bank, go into a landlord's office, and she can say my name. Even when I'm dead, I will be serving the cause that is so important to me. And this is why I think all of us should be doing this, that we leave the legacy, not of immediate fame and fortune and all of this. And if you're in a restaurant business, you, there's no fortune. Uh, <laughs> there is, it's not all of that. It really is that you leave. You know, I, I just want to end by saying that both Judy and I, I think we're both sowing the harvest we will never reap. Yeah. And that gives significance to our lives and what we do every day. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.